The Excursion, Book Second, The Solitary William Wordsworth and Days of Your How Fortunately Fared the Minstrel. Wandering on from hall to hall, baronial court or royal, cheered with gifts munificent, and love, and ladies' praise. Now meeting on his road an armed knight, now resting with a pilgrim by the side of a clear brook, beneath an abbey's roof one evening sumptuously lodged, the next, humbly in a religious hospital, or with some merry outlaws of the wood, or haply shrouded in a hermit's cell. Him, sleeping or awake, the robber spared. He walked protected from the sword of war by virtue of that sacred instrument his harp, suspended at the traveller's side. His dear companion wheresoe'er he went opening from land to land an easy way by melody, and by the charm of verse. Yet not the noblest of that honoured race drew happier, loftier, more impassioned, thoughts from his long journeyings and eventful life, than this obscure itinerant had skill to gather, ranging through the tamer ground of these our unimaginative days. Both while he trod the earth in humblest guise a cowrid with his burthen and his staff. And now, when free to move with lighter pace, what wonder, then, if I, whose favourite school hath been the fields, the roads, and rural lanes, looked on this guide with reverential love? Each with the other pleased, we now pursued our journey, under favourable skies. Turn wheresoe'er we would, he was a light unfailing, not a hamlet could we pass, rarely a house, that did not yield to him remembrances, or from his tongue call forth some way beguiling tale. Nor less regard accompanied those strains of apt discourse, which nature's various objects might inspire. And in the silence of his face I read his overflowing spirit. Birds and beasts, and the mute fish that glances in the stream, and harmless reptile coiling in the sun, and gorgeous insect hovering in the air, the fowl domestic, and the household dog in his capacious mind, he loved them all, their rights acknowledging he felt for all. Oft was occasion given me to perceive how the calm pleasures of the pasturing herd to happy contemplation soothed his walk. How the poor brute's condition, forced to run its course of suffering in the public road, sad contrast. All too often smote his heart with unavailing pity. Rich in love and sweet humanity, he was, himself, to the degree that he desired, beloved. Smiles of good will from faces that he knew greeted us all day long. We took our seats by many a cottage hearth, where he received the welcome of an inmate from afar, and I at once forgot, I was a stranger. Nor was he loath to enter ragged huts, huts where his charity was blessed. His voice heard as the voice of an experienced friend. And, sometimes where the poor man held dispute with his own mind, unable to subdue impatience through inaptness to perceive general distress in his particular lot, or cherishing resentment, or in vain struggling against it. With a soul perplexed, and finding in herself no steady power to draw the line of comfort that divides calamity, the chastisement of heaven, from the injustice of our brother men to him appeal was made as to a judge, who, with an understanding heart, allayed the perturbation, listened to the plea, resolved the dubious point, and sentence gave so grounded, so applied, that it was heard with softened spirit, even when it condemned. Such intercourse I witnessed, while we roved, now as his choice directed, now as mine, or both, with equal readiness of will our course submitting to the changeful breeze of accident. But when the rising sun had three times called us to renew our walk, my fellow traveller, with earnest voice, as if the thought were but a moment old, claimed absolute dominion for the day. We started and he led me toward the hills, up through an ample vale, with higher hills before us, mountains stern and desolate. But, in the majesty of distance, now set off, and to our can appearing fair of aspect, with aerial softness clad, and beautified with morning's purple beams. The wealthy, the luxurious, by the stress of business roused, or pleasure, ere their time, may roll in chariots, or provoke the hooves of the fleet coursers they be stride, to raise from earth the dust of morning, slow to rise. And they, if blessed with health and hearts at ease, shall lack not their enjoyment, but how faint compared with ours. Who, pacing side by side, could, with an eye of leisure, look on all that we beheld, and lend the listening sense to every grateful sound of earth and air. Pausing at will our spirits braced, our thoughts pleasant as roses in the thickets blown, and pure as dew bathing their crimson leaves.
mount slowly, son, that we may journey long, by this dark hill protected from thy beams, such is the summer pilgrim's frequent wish, but quickly from among our morning thoughts t'was chased away, for, toward the western side of the broad vale, casting a casual glance, we saw a throng of people, wherefore met, blithe notes of music, suddenly let loose on the thrilled ear, and flags uprising, yield prompt answer. They proclaim the annual wake, which the bright season favors. Tabor and pipe and purpose join to hasten or reprove the laggard rustic, and repay with boons of merriment the party-colored knot, already formed upon the village green. Beyond the limits of the shadow cast by the broad hill, glistened upon our sight that gay assemblage. Round them and above, glitter, with dark recesses interposed, casement, and cottage roof, and stems of trees half veiled in vapory cloud, the silver steam of dews fast melting on their leafy boughs by the strong sunbeams smitten. Like a mast of gold, the maypole shines, as if the rays of morning, aided by exhaling dew, with glass and influence could reanimate the faded garlands dangling from its sides. Said I, am person quo. The music and the sprightly scene invite us. Shall we quit our road, and join these festive matins? Am person quo. He replied, Am person quo. Not loath to linger I would here with you partake, not one hour merely, but till evening's close, the simple pastimes of the day and place. By the fleet racers, ere the sun be set, the turf of yon large pasture will be skimmed. There, too, the lusty wrestlers shall contend, but know we not that he, who intermits the appointed task and duties of the day, untunes full off the pleasures of the day. Checking the finer spirits that refuse to flow when purposes are lightly changed? A length of journey yet remains untraced, let us proceed. Am person quo. Then, pointing with his staff raised toward those craggy summits, his intent he thus imparted, Am person quo. In a spot that lies among yon mountain fastnesses concealed, you will receive, before the hour of noon, good recompense, I hope, for this day's toil, from sight of one who lives secluded there, lonesome and lost, of whom, and whose past life, not to forestall such knowledge as may be more faithfully collected from himself, this brief communication shall suffice. Though now sojourning there, he, like myself, sprang from a stock of lowly parentage among the wilds of Scotland in a tract where many a sheltered and well-tended plant, bears, on the humblest ground of social life, blossoms of piety and innocence. Such grateful promises as youth displayed, and, having shown in steady forward zeal, he to the ministry was duly called. And straight, incited by a curious mind filled with vague hopes, he undertook the charge of chaplain to a military troop cheered by the Highland bagpipe, as they marched in plaited vest his fellow countrymen. This office filling, yet by native power and force of native inclination made an intellectual ruler in the haunts of social vanity, he walked the world, gay, and affecting graceful gaiety. Lax, buoyant less a pastor with his flock than a soldier among soldiers lived in Rome where fortune led, and fortune, who oft proves the careless wanderer's friend, to him made known a blooming lady a conspicuous flower, admired for beauty, for her sweetness praised whom he had sensibility to love, ambition to attempt, and skill to win. For this fair bride, most rich in gifts of mind, not sparingly endowed with worldly wealth, his office he relinquished, and retired from the world's notice to a rural home. Youth season yet with him was scarcely past, and she was in youth's prime. How free their love, how full their joy! Till, pitiable doom! In the short course of one undreaded year death blasted all. Death suddenly overthrew two lovely children all that they possessed. The mother followed, miserably bare the one survivor stood. He wept, he prayed for his dismissal, day and night, compelled to hold communion with the grave, and face with pain the regions of eternity. An uncomplaining apathy displaced this anguish. And, indifferent to delight, to aim and purpose, he consumed his days, to private interests dead, and public care. So lived he so he might have died. But now, to the wide world's astonishment, appeared a glorious opening, the unlooked for dawn, that promised everlasting joy to France. Her voice of social transport reached even him. 
he broke from his contracted bounds, repaired to the great city, an emporium then of golden expectations, and receiving freights every day from a new world of hope. Thither his popular talents he transferred, and, from the pulpit, zealously maintained the cause of Christ in civil liberty, as one, and moving to one glorious end. Intoxicating service. I might say a happy service. For he was sincere as vanity and fondness for applause, and new and shapeless wishes, would allow. That righteous cause such power hath freedom bound, for one hostility, in friendly league, ethereal natures and the worst of slaves, was served by rival advocates that came from regions opposite as heaven and hell. One courage seemed to animate them all, and, from the dazzling conquests daily gained by their united efforts, there arose a proud and most presumptuous confidence in the transcendent wisdom of the age, and her discernment. Not alone in rights, and in the origin and bounds of power social and temporal, but in laws divine, deduced by reason, or to faith revealed. An overweening trust was raised, and fear cast out, alike of person and of thing. Plague from this union spread, whose subtle bane the strongest did not easily escape. And he, what wonder! took a mortal taint. How shall I trace the change, how bear to tell that he broke faith with them whom he had laid in earth's dark chambers, with a Christian's hope? An infidel content of holy writ stole by degrees upon his mind. And hence life, like that Roman Janus, debile faced. Vilest hypocrisy the laughing, gay hypocrisy, not leagued with fear, but pride. Smooth words he had to wheedle simple souls. But, for disciples of the inner school, old freedom was old servitude, and they the wisest whose opinions stooped the least to known restraints, and who most boldly drew hopeful prognostications from a creed, that, in the light of false philosophy, spread like a halo round a misty moon, widening its circle as the storms advance. His sacred function was at length renounced, and every day and every place enjoyed the unshackled layman's natural liberty. speech. Manners, morals, all without disguise? I do not wish to wrong him. Though the course of private life licentiously displayed and hallowed actions planted like a crown upon the insolent aspiring brow of spurious notions worn as open signs of prejudice subdued still he retained, mid much abasement, what he had received from nature, an intense and glowing mind. Wherefore, when humbled liberty grew weak, and mortal sickness on her face appeared, he colored objects to his own desires with a lover's passion. Yet his moods of pain were keen as those of better men, nay keener, as his fortitude was less, and he continued, when worse days were come, to deal about his sparkling eloquence, struggling against the strange reverse with zeal that showed like happiness. But, in despite of all this outside bravery, within, he neither felt encouragement nor hope, for moral dignity, and strength of mind, were wanting and simplicity of life, and reverence for himself, and, last and best, confiding thoughts, through love and fear of him before whose sight the troubles of this world are vain, as billows in a tossing sea. The glory of the times fading away the splendor, which had given a festal air to self-importance, hallowed it, and veiled from his own sight this gone, he forfeited all joy in human nature, was consumed, and vexed, and chafed by levity and scorn, and fruitless indignation. Galled by pride. Made desperate by contempt of men who throve before his sight in power or fame, and won, without desert, what he desired. Weak men, too weak even for his envy or his hate. Tormented thus, after a wandering course of discontent, and inwardly oppressed with malady and part, I fear, provoked by weariness of life he fixed his home, or, rather say, sate down by very chance, among these rugged hills, where now he dwells, and wastes the sad remainder of his hours, steeped in a self-indulging spleen, that wants not its own voluptuousness. On this resolved, with this content, that he will live and die forgotten, at safe distance from a world not moving to his mind. Amperson quo. These serious words closed the preparatory notices that served my fellow traveler to beguile the way while we advanced up that wide vale. Diverging now as if his quest had been some secret of the mountains, cavern, full of water, or some lofty eminence, 
renowned for splendid prospect far and wide, we scaled, without a track to ease our steps, a steep ascent, and reached a dreary plain, with a tumultuous waste of huge hilltops before us. Savage region, which I paced dispirited, when, all at once, behold, beneath our feet, a little lowly veil, a lowly veil, and yet uplifted high among the mountains, even as if the spot had been from eldest time by wish of theirs so placed, to be shut out from all the world, urn like it was in shape, deep as an urn, with rocks encompassed, save that to the south was one small opening, where a heath-clad ridge supplied a boundary less abrupt and close, a quiet treeless nook, with two green fields, a liquid pool that glittered in the sun, and one bare dwelling, one abode, no more. It seemed the home of poverty and toil, though not of want, the little fields, made green by husbandry of many thrifty years, paid cheerful tribute to the moorland house. There crows the cock, single in his domain, the small birds find in spring no thicket there to shroud them. Only from the neighboring vales the cuckoo, straggling up to the hilltops, showeth faint tidings of some gladder place. Ah! What a sweet recess, thought I, is here. Instantly throwing down my limbs at ease upon a bed of heath, full many a spot of hidden beauty have I chanced to espy among the mountains. Never one like this. So lonesome, and so perfectly secure. Not melancholy, no, for it is green, and bright, and fertile, furnished in itself with the few needful things that life requires. In rugged arms how softly does it lie, how tenderly protected. Far and near we have an image of the pristine earth, the planet in its nakedness, were this man's only dwelling, sole appointed seat, first, last, and single, in the breathing world, it could not be more quiet. Peace is here or nowhere. Days unruffled by the gale of public news or private. Years that pass forgetfully. And called upon to pay the common penalties of mortal life, sickness, or accident, or grief, or pain. On these and kindred thoughts intend I lay in silence musing by my comrade's side, he also silent. When from out the heart of that profound abyss a solemn voice, or several voices in one solemn sound, was heard ascending. Mournful, deep, and slow the cadence, as of psalms a funeral dirge. We listened, looking down upon the hut, but seeing no one, meanwhile from below the strain continued, spiritual as before. And now distinctly could I recognize these words, am person quo. Shall in the grave thy love be known, in death thy faithfulness. Am person quo. Am person quo. God rest his soul. Said the old man, abruptly breaking silence, am person quo. He is departed, and finds peace at last. Am person quo. This scarcely spoken, and those holy strains not ceasing. Forth appeared in view a band of rustic persons, from behind the hut bearing a coffin in the midst, with which they shaped their course along the sloping side of that small valley, singing as they moved. A sober company and few, the men bareheaded, and all decently attired. Some steps when they had thus advanced, the dirge ended. And, from the stillness that ensued recovering, to my friend I said, Am person quo. You spake, methought with apprehension that these rites are paid to him upon whose shy retreat this day we purpose to intrude. Am person quo. I did so, but let us hence, that we may learn the truth, perhaps it is not he but someone else for whom this pious service is performed. Some other tenant of the solitude. Am person quo. So, to a steep and difficult descent trusting ourselves, we wound from crag to crag, where passage could be won. And, as the last of the mute train, behind the heathy top of that off-sloping outlet, disappeared, I, more impatient in my downward course, had landed upon easy ground. And there stood waiting for my comrade. When behold an object that enticed my steps aside. A narrow, winding, entry opened out into a platform that lay, sheepfold-wise, enclosed between an upright mass of rock and one old moss-grown wall. A cool recess and fanciful. For where the rock and wall met in an angle, hung a penthouse, framed by thrusting two root staves into the wall and overlaying them with mountain sods. To weather fend a little turf-built seat whereon a full-grown man might rest, nor dread the burning sunshine, 
or a transient shower, but the whole plainly wrought by children's hands, whose skill had thronged the floor with a proud show of baby houses, curiously arranged, no wanting ornament of walks between, with mimic trees inserted in the turf, and gardens interposed. Pleased with the sight, I could not choose but beckon to my guide, who, entering, round him threw a careless glance, impatient to pass on, when I exclaimed, Amperson quo. Lo. What is here? Amperson quo. And, stooping down, drew forth a book, that, in the midst of stones and moss and wreck of party-colored earthenware, aptly disposed, had lent its help to raise one of those petty structures. Amperson quo. His it must be. Amperson quo. Exclaimed the wanderer. Amperson quo. Cannot but be his, and he is gone. Amperson quo. The book, which in my hand had opened of itself, for it was swollen with searching damp, and seemingly had lain to the injurious elements exposed from week to week, I found to be a work in the French tongue, a novel of Voltaire, his famous optimist. Amperson quo. Unhappy man. Amperson quo. Exclaimed my friend, Amperson quo. Here then has been to him retreat within retreat, a sheltering place within how deep a shelter. He had fits, even to the last, of genuine tenderness, and loved the haunts of children, here, no doubt, pleasing and pleased, he shared their simple sports, or sate companionless. And here the book, left and forgotten in his careless way, must by the cottage children have been found, heaven bless them, and their inconsiderate work. To what odd purpose have the darlings turned this sad memorial of their hapless friend? Amperson quo. Amperson quo. Me, Amperson quo. Said I, Amperson quo. Most doth it surprise, to find such book in such a place. Amperson quo. Amperson quo. A book it is, Amperson quo. He answered, Amperson quo. To the person suited well though little suited to surrounding things, tis strange, I grand. And stranger still had been to see the man who owned it, dwelling here, with one poor shepherd, far from all the world. Now, if our errand hath been thrown away, as from these intimations I forebode, grieved shall I be less for my sake than yours, and least of all for him who is no more. Amperson quo. By this, the book was in the old man's hand, and he continued, glancing on the leaves an eye of scorn, Amperson quo. The lover, Amperson quo. Said he, Amperson quo. Doomed to love when hope hath felt him whom no depth of privacy is deep enough to hide, hath yet his bracelet or his lock of hair, and that is joy to him. When change of times hath summoned kings to scaffolds, do but give the faithful servant, who must hide his head henceforth in whatsoever nook he may, a kerchief sprinkled with his master's blood, and he too hath his comforter. How poor, beyond all poverty how destitute, must that man have been left, who, hither driven, flying or seeking, could yet bring with him no dearer relique, and no better stay, than this dull product of a scoffer's pen, impure conceits discharging from a heart hardened by impious pride. I did not fear to tax you with this journey. Amperson quo. Mildly said my venerable friend, as forth we step into the presence of the cheerful light Amperson Quo. For I have knowledge that you do not shrink from moving spectacles. But let us on. Amperson Quo. So speaking, on he went, and at the word I followed, till he made a sudden stand, for full in view, approaching through a gate that opened from the enclosure of green fields into the rough uncultivated ground, behold the man whom he had fancied dead. I knew from his deportment, mien, and dress, that it could be no other. A pale face, a meager person, tall, and in a garb not rustic dull and faded like himself. He saw us not, though distant but few steps. For he was busy, dealing, from a store upon a broadleaf carried, choice of strings of red ripe currants. Gift by which he strove, with intermixture of endearing words, to soothe a child, who walked beside him weeping as if disconsolate. Amperson quo. They to the grave are bearing him, my little one, Amperson quo. He said, Amperson quo. To the dark pit. But he will feel no pain. His body is at rest, 
his soul in heaven. Amperson quo. More might have followed but my honored friend broke in upon the speaker with a frank and cordial greeting. Vivid was the light that flashed and sparkled from the other's eyes. He was all fire, no shadow on his brow remained, nor sign of sickness on his face. Hamds joined he with his visitant, a grasp, an eager grasp, and many moments space when the first glow of pleasure was no more, and, of the sad appearance which at once had vanished, much was come and coming back an amicable smile retained the life which it had unexpectedly received, upon his hollow cheek. Amperson quo. How kind, Amperson quo. He said, Amperson quo. Nor could your coming have been better timed. For this, you see, is in our narrow world a day of sorrow. I have here a charge and quo. And, speaking thus, he patted tenderly the sunburnt forehead of the weeping child Amperson quo. A little mourner, whom it is my task to comfort. But how came ye? If yon track which doth at once befriend us and betray conducted hither your most welcome feet, ye could not miss the funeral train they yet have scarcely disappeared. Amperson quo. Amperson quo. This blooming child, Amperson quo. Said the old man, Amperson quo. Is of an age to weep at any grave or solemn spectacle, inly distressed or overpowered with awe, he knows not wherefore. But the boy today, perhaps is shedding orphan's tears. You also must have sustained a loss. Amperson quo. Amperson quo. The hand of death, Amperson quo. He answered, Amperson quo. Has been here. But could not well have fallen more lightly, if it had not fallen upon myself. Amperson quo. The other left these words unnoticed, thus continuing Amperson quo. From yon crag? down whose steep sides we dropped into the vale, we heard the hymn they sang a solemn sound heard anywhere. But in a place like this tis more than human. Many precious rites and customs of our rural ancestry are gone, or stealing from us. This, I hope, will last forever. Oft on my way have I stood still, though but a casual passenger, so much I felt the awfulness of life, in that one moment when the course is lifted in silence, with a hush of decency, then from the threshold moves with song of peace, and confidential yearnings, towards its home, its final home on earth. What traveler who, how far so a stranger, does not own the bond of brotherhood, when he sees them go, a mute procession on the houseless road, or passing by some single tenement or clustered dwellings, where again they raise the monitory voice? But most of all it touches, it confirms, and elevates, then, when the body, soon to be consigned ashes to ashes, dust bequeathed to dust, is raised from the church aisle, and forward borne upon the shoulders of the next in love, the nearest in affection or in blood. Yea, by the very mourners who had knelt beside the coffin, resting on its lid in silent grief their unuplifted heads, and heard meanwhile the Samus mournful plaint, and that most awful scripture which declares we shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. Have I not seen ye likewise may have seen son, husband, brothers brothers side by side, and son and father also side by side, rise from that posture, and in concert move, on the green turf following the vested priest, four dear supporters of one senseless weight, from which they do not shrink, and under which they feign not, but advance towards the open grave step after step together, with their firm and hidden faces, he that suffers most, he outwardly, and inwardly perhaps, the most serene, with most undaunted eye. Oh! Blessed are they who live and die like these, loved with such love, and with such sorrow mourned. Amperson quo! Amperson quo! That poor man taken hence today, Amperson quo! replied the solitary, with a faint sarcastic smile which did not please me, Amperson quo! Must be deemed, I fear, of the unpost for he will surely sink into his mother earth without such pomp of grief, depart without occasion given by him for such a ray of fortitude. Full seventy winters hath he lived, and mark. This simple child will mourn his one short hour, and I shall miss him, scanty tribute. Yet, this wanting, he would leave the sight of men, if love were his sole claim upon their care, like a ripe date which in the desert falls without a hand to gather it. 
Ampersand quo. At this I interposed, though loath to speak, and said, Ampersand quo. Can it be thus among so small a band as ye must needs be here? In such a place I would not willingly, methinks, lose sight of a departing cloud. Ampersand quo. Ampersand quo. Twas not for love and quo. Answered the sick man with a careless voice Ampersand quo. That I came hither. Neither have I found among associates who have power of speech, nor in such other converse as is here, temptation so prevailing as to change that mood, or undermine my first resolve. Ampersand quo. Then, speaking in like careless sort, he said to my benign companion, Ampersand quo. Pity tis that fortune did not guide you to this house a few days earlier. Then would you have seen what stuff the dwellers in a solitude, that seems by nature hollowed out to be the seat and bosom of pure innocence, are made of an ungracious matter this, which, for truth's sake, yet in remembrance too of past discussions with this zealous friend and advocate of humble life, I now will force upon his notice. Undeterred by the example of his own pure course, and that respect and deference which a soul may fairly claim, by niggard age enriched in what she most doth value, love of God and his frail creature man. But ye shall hear. I talk and ye are standing in the sun without refreshment. Amperson quo. Quickly had he spoken, and, with light steps still quicker than his words, led toward the cottage. Homely was the spot. And, to my feeling, ere we reached the door, had almost a forbidding nakedness. Less fair, I grand, even painfully less fair, than it appeared when from the beetling rock we had looked down upon it. All within, as left by the departed company, was silent. Save the solitary clock that on mine ear ticked with a mournful sound. Following our guide we clumped the cottage stairs and reached a small apartment dark and low, which was no sooner entered than our host said gaily, Amperson quo. This is my domain, my cell, my hermitage, my cabin, what you will I love it better than a snail his house. But now ye shall be feasted with our best. Amperson quo. So, with more ardor than an unripe girl left one day mistress of her mother's stores, he went about his hospitable task. My eyes were busy, and my thoughts no less, and pleased I looked upon my gray-haired friend, as if to thank him. He returned that look, cheered, plainly, and yet serious. What a wreck had we about us! Scattered was the floor, and, in like sort, chair, window seat, and shelf, with books, maps, fossils, withered plants and flowers, and tufts of mountain moss. Mechanic tools lay intermixed with scraps of paper, some scribbled with verse, a broken angling rod and shattered telescope, together linked by cobwebs, stood within a dusty nook. And instruments of music, some half-made, some in disgrace, hung dangling from the walls. But speedily the promise was fulfilled. A feast before us and a courteous host inviting us in glee to sit and eat. A napkin, white as foam of that rough brook by which it had been bleached, o'erspread the board, and was itself half covered with a store of dainties, oaten bread, curd, cheese, and cream, and cakes of butter curiously embossed, butter that had imbibed from meadow flowers a golden hue, delicate as their own faintly reflected in a lingering stream. Nor lacked, for more delight on that warm day, our table, small parade of garden fruits, and hortleberries from the mountain side. The child, who long ere this had stilled his sobs, was now a help to his late comforter, and moved, a willing page, as he was bid, ministering to our need. In genial mood, while at our pastoral banquet thus we sate fronting the window of that little cell, I could not, ever an anon, forbear to glance an upward look on two huge peaks that from some other veil peered into this. Amperson quo. Those lusty twins, Amperson quo. exclaimed our host, Amperson quo. If here it were your lot did well, would soon become your prized companions. Many are the notes which, in his tuneful course, the wind draws forth from rocks, woods, caverns, heaths, and dashing shores. And well those lofty brethren bear their part in the wild concert chiefly when the storm rides high. Then all the upper air they fill with roaring sound, that ceases not to flow, like smoke, along the level of the blast, in mighty current. Theirs, too, 
is the song of stream and headlong flood that seldom fails. And, in the grim and breathless hour of noon, methinks that I have heard them echo back the thunder's greeting. Nor have nature's laws left them ungifted with the power to yield music of finer tone. A harmony, so do I call it, though it be the hand of silence, though there be no voice. The clouds, the mist, the shadows, light of golden suns, motions of moonlight, all come thither touch, and have an answer thither come, and shape a language not unwelcome to sick hearts and idle spirits. There the sun himself, at the calm close of summer's longest day, rests his substantial orb. Between those heights and on the top of either pinnacle, more keenly than elsewhere in night's blue vault, sparkle the stars, as of their station proud. Thoughts are not busier in the mind of man than the mute agents stirring there, alone here do I sit and watch and co A fall of voice, regretted like the nightingale's last note, had scarcely closed this high-wrought strain of rapture or with inviting smile the wanderer said, Amperson quo. Now for the tale with which you threatened us. Amperson quo. Amperson quo. In truth the threat escaped me unawares, should the tale tire you. Let this challenge stand for my excuse. Dissevered from mankind, as to your eyes and thoughts we must have seemed when ye looked down upon us from the crag, islanders mid a stormy mountain sea, we are not so. Perpetually we touch upon the vulgar ordinances of the world. And he, whom this our cottage hath today relinquished, lived dependent for his bread upon the laws of public charity. The housewife, tempted by such slender gains as might from that occasion be distilled, opened, as she before had done for me, her doors to admit this homeless pensioner. The portion gave of course but wholesome fare which appetite required a blind bell nook, such as she had, the kennel of his rest. This, in itself not ill, would yet have been ill-born in earlier life. But his was now the still contentedness of seventy years. Calm did he sit under the widespread tree of his old age, and yet less calm and meek, winningly meek or venerably calm, than slow and torpid. Paying in this wise a penalty, if penalty it were, for spendthrift feats, excesses of his prime. I loved the old man, for I pitied him. A task it was, I own, to hold discourse with one so slow in gathering up his thoughts, but he was a cheap pleasure to my eyes. Mild, inoffensive, ready in his way, and helpful to his utmost power, and there our housewife knew full well what she possessed. He was her vassal of all labor, tilled her garden, from the pasture fetched her kin. And, one among the orderly array of haymakers, beneath the burning sun maintained his place. Or heedfully pursued his course, on errands bound, to other vales, leading sometimes an inexperienced child too young for any profitable task. So moved he like a shadow that performed substantial service. Mark me now, and learn for what reward. The moon her monthly round hath not completed since our dame, the queen of this one cottage and this lonely dell, into my little sanctuary rushed voice to a rueful treble humanized, and features in deplorable dismay. I treat the matter lightly, but, alas! It is most serious, persevering rain hath fallen in torrents. All the mountain tops were hidden and black vapors coursed their sides. This had I seen, and saw. But, till she spake, was wholly ignorant that my ancient friend who at her bidding, early and alone, had clumb aloft to delve the moorland turf for winter fuel to his noontide meal returned not, and now, happily, on the heights lay at the mercy of this raging storm. Inhuman! Said I was an old man's life not worth the trouble of a thought. Alas! This notice comes too late. With joy I saw her husband enter from a distant vale. We sallied forth together. Found the tools which the neglected veteran had dropped, but through all quarters looked for him in vain. We shouted but no answer. Darkness fell without remission of the blast or shower, and fears for our own safety drove us home. I, who weep little, did, I will confess, the moment I was seated here alone, honor my little cell with some few tears which anger and resentment could not dry. All night the storm endured. And, soon as help had been collected from the neighboring vale, with morning we renewed our quest, the wind was fallen, the rain abated, but the hills lay shrouded in impenetrable mist. And long and hopelessly we sought in vain, till, 
chancing on that lofty ridge to pass a heap of ruin almost without walls and wholly without roof, the bleached remains of a small chapel, where, in ancient time, the peasants of these lonely valleys used to meet for worship on that central height. We there espy the object of our search, lying full three parts buried among tufts of heath planned, under and above him strewn, to baffle, as he might, the watery storm, and there we found him breathing peaceably, snug as a child that hides itself in sport mid a green haycock in a sunny field. We speak he made reply, but would not stir at our entreaty, less from want of power than apprehension and bewildering thoughts. So was he lifted gently from the ground, and with their freight homeward the shepherds moved through the dull mist, I following when a step, a single step, that freed me from the skirts of the blind vapor. Open to my view glory beyond all glory ever seen by waking sense or by the dreaming soul. The appearance, instantaneously disclosed, was of a mighty city boldly say a wilderness of building, sinking far and self withdrawn into a boundless depth, far sinking into splendor without end. Fabric it seemed of diamond and of gold, with alabaster domes, and silver spires, and blazing terrace upon terrace, high uplifted. Here, Serene pavilions bright, in avenues disposed. There, towers bejured with battlements that on their restless front bore stars illumination of all gems. By earthly nature had the effect been wrought upon the dark materials of the storm now pacified. On them, and on the coves and mountain steeps and summits, Harunto the vapors had receded, taking there their station under a cerulean sky. Oh, twas an unimaginable sight. Clouds, miss, Streams, watery rocks and emerald turf, clouds of all tincture, rocks and sapphire sky, confused, commingled, mutually inflamed, molten together, and composing thus, each lost in each, that marvelous array of temple, palace, citadel, and huge fantastic pomp of structure without name, in fleecy folds voluminous, enwrapped. Right in the midst, where interspace appeared of open court, an object like a throne under a shining canopy of state stood fixed. And fixed resemblances were seen to implements of ordinary use, but vast in size, in substance glorified. Such as by Hebrew prophets were beheld in vision forms uncouth of mightiest power for admiration and mysterious awe. This little veil, a dwelling place of man, lay low beneath my feet. Twas visible I saw not, but I felt that it was there. That which I saw was the revealed abode of spirits in beatitude, my heart swelled in my breast I have been dead, I cried, and now I live. Oh! Wherefore do I live? And with that pang I pray to be no more. But I forget our charge, as utterly I then forgot him, there I stood and gazed, the apparition faded not away, and I descended. Having reached the house, I found its rescued inmate safely lodged and in serene possession of himself, beside a fire whose genial warmth seemed met by a faint sheening from the heart, a gleam, of comfort, spread over his pallid face. Great show of joy the housewife made, and truly was glad to find her conscience set at ease. And not less glad, for sake of her good name, that the poor sufferer had escaped with life. But, though he seemed at first to have received no harm, and uncomplaining as before went through his usual tasks, a silent change soon showed itself, he lingered three short weeks, and from the cottage hath been born today. So ends my dolorous tale, and glad I am that it is ended. Am person quo. At these words he turned and, with blithe air of open fellowship, brought from the cupboard wine and stouter cheer, like one who would be merry. Seeing this, my grey-haired friend said courteously and quo. Nay, Nay, you have regaled us as a hermit ought. Now let us forth into the sun. Am person quo. Our host rose, though reluctantly, and forth we went.